What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for seercustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxana. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys. And I send you tremendous love and light. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my Zoom virtual studio with a really cool fellow by the name of David Richmond. David, how are you, man? I am fantastic, Jay. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to have you here. So guys, let me give you his bio. He is an author, a public speaker, a philanthropist. I love that word. It's one of those words where when you speak it, it actually sounds like it means. An endurance athlete whose mission is to form more meaningful human connections through storytelling. His first book, Winning in the Middle of the Pack, discussed how to get more out of ourselves than ever imagined. And with Cycle of Lives, David shares the interconnected stories of people overcoming trauma, one of my influ influ influence and emphasis is now, and delves deeply into their emotional journeys with cancer. So brother, I appreciate you coming on the Jay Campbell podcast today. It's an honor to have you. Um, as I always do, um, how did you get on the Jay Campbell podcast here today? Well, um, I had uh, looked at, um, I, you know, I have a team, I'm, I, I have a book that I'm marketing, right? And why I call myself a philanthropist is, uh, and, and not just because of this, but part of the book is that I'm giving 100% of the net proceeds to the cancer focused charities that the book awesome. chose, right? Beautiful. So this is not a labor of trying to make money. This is really a labor of love. And I have a um, a goal of helping equip people to start hard conversations. And yeah. in order to spread that word, I have to spread the word of people that are influential like you. And awesome. so um, I'd like to say that I am um, a disciple. I'm not. I reached out because you're, uh, you're, you're a popular guy. You have a following that is um, very dedicated to you. And I really, really was taken by your messages and the themes of what you do and empowering people to live optimally and to, uh, to transform themselves into better people. And I'm just like, why the heck wouldn't I want to be a part of that? That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, again, but I appreciate all those. Thank you for the kudos. Um, and it yeah. is, it's always, as I told you off the air, it's an honor to work and to connect with people who are really here serving creation. And you're clearly doing that. And, uh, you know, I have, uh, great admiration and respect for a person, you know, like you to give away, um, you know, the proceeds and stuff like that. So it's an honor. So let's, let's jump into, um, you know, some of the main points. And again, this can go anywhere. This is always very conversational. Sure. Um, but the genesis of the cycle of lives project book, obviously that delves into the emotional aspects of cancer and other traumas. And let me just preference to say that, as I told you off the air, and I, and I, this is my jam. Now I talk about this every day. I mean, this planet, we have to heal the emotional trauma of, you know, the collective aspect of humankind right now. And obviously there's many, many reasons for people to be traumatized. This is compelling and obviously motivates me because it's such an important thing right now for people to first, you know, admit 
to acknowledge and then, of course, to work to integrate and overcome their trauma. So obviously, I'm interested in, in finding out more about your book. So why don't you start right there? Yeah. So, um, look, I totally agree with that. And we are, um, as humans, only connected, I think, by one thing, and that is our emotions. And, um, you know, I mean, I, that analogy I like to give is there's not a human alive. You put them in a cave that's a small cave. And you put a bear, a hungry bear at the front of that cave, there's not a single human alive that's not going to have the emotion of fear. Right. And um, we can be all motivated by different things. We can have, uh, you know, uh, much diversity, but really the only thing that connects us is our emotion. And um, especially like people are pretty good at expressing joy and gratitude. They're pretty good at that. What they're really not good at is understanding some of the emotion behind trauma and um, both what we're going through and what other people are going through. I mean, when, when uh, you find out that a friend of yours is going to get married, Jay, it's very easy to jump up and down and go, oh my God, that's so great. And I'm so happy to hear it. And uh, oh my, and you can go a hundred different ways with that discussion. But you find out from that same friend that they had a bad day because a really good friend of theirs at work just got diagnosed with terminal cancer. You go like, oh, I'm sorry, man. And you walk away because you don't know what to say. And it's, it's, it, so, so, so the genesis of the, the project was, um, I witnessed that my sister was dying of cancer, um, and a young family, you know, the, um, circle of friends, vibrant life, whatever. And I just, I witnessed that, uh, through her journey and through the people that I ran into when I was doing events, like raise money for the cancer center that took care of her and stuff, the people just weren't equipped to with the emotional side of that trauma. And I said, I got to figure out a way to, to, to help change that. Right. Right. Beautiful. Um, all right. Well, just talk a little bit about the book again. Yeah. You know, as I told you, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, obviously other than. Okay. So your, here's, your what, here's what I did. Here's what I did, Jay, is I said, if we're all connected by emotion, okay. Um, how can I get people to understand what others are going through or have gone through? So I said, let me put these things together. Let me put together a range of emotion because uh, uh, people can have different responses to trauma. Sure. Uh, let's deal with different ages because uh, trauma when you're young, medium, old, um, certainly has a, a different effect on how you deal with it. Um, let's deal with the severity of the trauma. Are you a one and done? Were you, or are you dealing with a lifetime of addiction or a lifetime of abuse? Were you abandoned as a kid? You know, what is the level or are you just like, oh, I, you know, I, I had one event and I want to know, know how to get over it. So the range of uh, a depth of the, the trauma. And I said, let's put all those things together. And then also, obviously I wanted not just people that had cancer, but people that took care of others, people had friends, people that were professionals. And I said, from all of that collective uh, uh, perspectives, let me find super compelling, evocative people. Let me dive super deep into their heads and I interview them for a couple of years. Uh, and I want to bring their story because here's what I said, Jay. I said, point A is when you encounter cancer. Right. Point B is today. How did you get from point A to point B emotionally in relation to all the trauma that happened in your life before point A? So, um, and, and, the, and, and the goal of that, Jay, was again, to equip people to better understand what people are going through, what they might be going through, what they have gone through, so that we can start more meaningful, heart-centered conversations with ourselves, with our loved ones, with our friends, and maybe understand this trauma and, 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 and move forward from it. So that was the genesis of the project. The second part of it, just to give you just to tie it together for you, Jay, sure. as I said, you're out your whole idea of we're all connected, right? Well, what better way to connect the stories than to get on my bicycle and do a solo bike ride, zigzagging up and down and around the country to go meet these people that I've been talking to for the, for a few years and connect the stories and then talk about the people I met along the way and some of the events and then dealing my own dealing with, with the emotional issues around, around losing my sister. So the book is these 15 individual stories told from the perspective of that person. They're wildly diverse, very, very evocative, very inspiring, hopeful, you know, they're, they're, they're very emotional. And then in between each one of the stories, is a small little narrative about my bike ride around the country to meet all of them and the people I met along the way. 
That's awesome. So by the way, um, logistically, well, how did you do it? Like, where did you start? And where? I started in Los Angeles. I started um, uh, at the end of summer in Los Angeles, went down to San Diego, went across through Ari- the desert in Arizona, up to New Mexico, down through Texas, which was crazy because I, I literally zigzagged Texas because I had to go um, uh, over to Dallas, down to Austin, back up to Houston. And wow. then I went over to uh, Louisiana, through the Gulf states. I turned right at the panhandle and went all the way down to Tampa to visit somebody at the uh, in Tampa and the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, then crossed over to Orlando and then biked up to New York City. Wow. So you go through, I uh, so you went along the eastern uh, seaboard route yes. then. You didn't go through any of like, you didn't go through Georgia. You went through the Carolinas and up through. Well, I hit Georgia just, just to write, uh, just because I, I, when I left Florida, <clears throat> I, you got to hit Georgia before you go uh, yeah. anywhere else. Valdosta. Valdosta. Exactly. And then Jay, I did it when um, <laughs> a Hurricane Matthew was in town. A couple of years ago, and that pushed me inland about 100 miles. And I actually was, I got a great story about biking through the hurricane and um, yeah, literally through a hurricane. And, um, but did you have was, any media covering you or like a backup you know, van, you know, following you in case you fell over of exhaustion or anything like that? I fell over of exhaustion every night. And um, my fiance at the time, my wife now, um, was very supportive of me. I, I, I I'd say I, I did it in 45 days. So 4,700 wow. miles in 45 days. So I was doing it quick. That's pretty um, amazing. Yeah. And so every day I was pretty beat, but, um, for probably about 30 of those days, I had support, mostly my, my wife, sometimes friends. Um, I did, uh, quite a bit of media along the way. Um, and, but I had to get to from point A to point B every day. So when you're on a big steel bike and you got a lot of your own supplies and whatever, it's pretty heavy and there's a lot of wind and whatever. I was on the bike anywhere. I think my shortest day was 11 hours. My longest day was 17 hours. So I was on the bike a lot. That's awesome, man. That's literally amazing. Yeah. Um, So like, how does it, how is it helping start the hard conversations? Well, um, so here's the deal, Jay, is that there's two, there's two aspects of each story that I think are amazing. Right. And I, sh- I, share, I share this only because th- there's not a lot of a repetition in the stories and people's experiences, except for these two things. One is that everybody is absolutely stunningly amazing. Yeah. And each of those people thought, oh, why do you want to talk to me? My story's nothing, right? Right. Because we're all just living our life. We don't think what we're doing is amazing. I mean, it's, it's cool. And what you do is cool, but you, you just do what you do. You don't think it's amazing, but if somebody could get in your head and understand what's going on and what drives you, that's probably a really good story to tell. So that's one aspect of it. And I think that we identify with people, if we understand them and we, if we get in their head, if I knew what made you tick Jay, I might understand you a little bit more. And if I was interested, if you were interesting enough once I understood what made you tick, I might be able to take something from that and bring it to my, to my life and my interpersonal interactions. And so that was one aspect of it. The second aspect of it was, you know how we often say something like, oh my God, I could never understand how somebody could do that. Or Absolutely. I can't imagine what they've gone through. I can't, I can't even imagine, right? I, I talked to somebody yesterday who was a caregiver for 10 years for somebody that was going through a cancer journey for 10 years. Wow. Could you imagine that? And I said to myself, how in the world could you ever do something like that? Right? So we asked that a lot. And so when I, when it came to the stories, Jay, I said, can I ask you anything? And not everybody was willing to go there. Some people wanted to, and they couldn't, but I said, can I ask you anything? And so the answer to your question is because there is no barrier to the information that was tucked away in their brains and in their hearts and in their minds and in their souls. There's no barrier to that. I'm able to bring those stories of these really interesting, amazing people together and how they overcame really amazing, very difficult, traumatic experiences. And I think, you know, once you understand something and you can identify with it, maybe you can apply it to yourself. And I'll tell you, um, one of the very first reviews I got, Jay, was from a woman who's a critical care nurse 
And she says, I've been a critical care nurse for 15 years. She said, and almost all of your stories affected me in such a way that when I put down your book, I knew I'm going to be a better nurse. And I went, Oh crap. That's good. And she said, because she could understand what people are going through a lot more. She thought she knew, but she had no idea. Wow. After reading the book, she knew. And so that's how I'm going to start the hard conversations is because I might be able to um, adapt myself uh, here or there a little bit if I could really get into your head and know what makes you tick wow. and apply it to myself. Right. That's awesome, man. And, and, you know, to that point, that's profound, you know, praise. Um, but to that point, most people are really reluctant to address and, and, and really truly deal with, you know, trauma. And we all have it, as you said, you know, very elegantly already. I mean, we all have trauma. I mean, a lot of us experience it coming out of the birth canal. And then depending on, you know, what happens to us along the way, it, it, it's every other day or every other minute, you know, some people, but it's just, it's a willingness to confront the issue and then to seek help. And I, I mean, you know, I'm so big on this. I, so I talk, so I talk about nowadays, but you know, a lot of people get really stuck and it's very, it becomes very difficult, you know, due to ego or shame or any of these things where they yeah. just can't accept yeah you know, ultimately that this is what they're dealing with. And then it becomes, you know, intricately tied into their existence. Oh, absolutely. And look, um, uh, you, you hit it right on the head, whatever it is that's causing people to not deal with it. Right. I think a big part of it is being safe. Right. I, right. I, I feel like people, people aren't safe. They're not safe right. to be themselves. They're worried, how am I going to be interpreted? Are people going to think I'm, look at, if you, if you have a very serious illness, um, you don't maybe want to burden people, right? Maybe you feel guilty that you're going to be burdening people. Maybe um, you're embarrassed because you need help. Maybe it reminds you of a difficult time that you witnessed um, a, a parent go through. I, there could be a million reasons that are not allowing you to pro properly process the trauma properly communicate what you need from people and really be heart centered, grounded in tune with another human being or met multiple human beings in order to go, go through it and, and, and help you get to the other side, help you help you come out stronger. We're just not equipped to do that. Right. Can, can I tell you a super quick story, Jay, about uh, sure. on mm -hmm. the right? So this is indicative of why I wrote the book. Okay. So I'm in New Mexico I have a buddy and, and he says, Hey, you know, my family is in town. I mean, my family lives in town. I want you to um, come to brunch. They want to thank you for, for what you're doing. And I went, Oh, that's great. So I walk into the brunch, my, my wife, my wife and I walk into the brunch and his dad, older guy brings me aside and he goes, Hey, you know, this, this talking about emotion and what's in here. And he points to his head and what's in here. And he points to his heart is so important when it comes to cancer. Just nobody talks about it. And I had a difficult time, you know, I had leukemia and blah, 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 blah. And he starts telling me a story in a, in a two minutes uh, story and he sits down. Then his daughter, my buddy's sister comes over and she says, Oh my God, I can't believe how great this is. This is so awesome. People need to talk about their cancer and the emotion side of it. It's so difficult. When I had stage three breast cancer, it's affected me in such a way that I left my job. I became a lobbyist for patient rights. And it's so important that people are in tune with their emotions and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wow, I guess not everybody is as jacked up about this stuff as I think they are. And so at the end of the brunch, I get up and I make my little uh, monologuing speech. And I say to, to the dad, hey, I'm super glad that you're able to talk about these things. And I look at the daughter and I say, I'm super glad that you're able to talk about these things. And they both kind of look down in their lap. And I go, what? You didn't talk to each other? And they were like, no. Comes to find out that the dad, he's old school. He, he, he wants to go through this alone. He doesn't want to burden his family. Turns out the daughter she kind of knew what the dad went through, but not really, right? And she doesn't want to make him feel guilty or make him think he's going to lose a daughter. And they never talked about it. They both told me how great it was to have this thing. They're incredibly close. They kind of oh, had the same trauma. And they're both begging me to put this book out because it will help people. And yet they hadn't done what they're hoping that this book will do. And yeah. I went, that's why I'm writing the book. Wow. That's amazing, man. Totally Pretty cool, amazing. right? Yeah. I mean... It's amazing. I mean, you kind of already mentioned it about the proceeds being donated to the nonprofits. Yeah. Um, but you did, you know, ultimately the book, the, the participants are the ones that chose it. Do you want a little talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah. So um, I feel really fortunate. I mean, listen, when, when you, you know, when, when you have, when you go through something as traumatic as cancer, usually you want to give back. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in the cancer community, people really do want to give back. And a lot, a lot of people who belong to um, certain wellness organizations, recovery organizations, survivor organizations, they want to give back. Um, you know, they, they, they stay involved in fundraising events or whatever. And I find that to be so overwhelmingly great. Not everybody uh, ends up giving back, but I find that in the cancer community, that is a, a, a constant and it's really heartwarming. And so when I was talking to each uh, person, it just naturally came up that they had some affinity for an organization. Um, in fact, one of my uh, book participants, um, the, he ended up working at the cancer center that saved his life. Wow. So he was, he was a, a banker working at a big inve investment banking firm, left that firm to go work at, for the cancer center that saved his life when he was a young kid. So, so right. So that, that exists. So each person told me they had an affinity for a certain organization, uh, you know, Moffitt cancer center, uh, Perlmutter cancer center, American cancer society, uh, cancer wellness community, you name it a bunch of different other ones. And they just said, Hey, since you're donating hundred percent of the proceeds to the book, uh, the book, um, can, can my organization get a piece? So, um, I had to, you know, this, you're a writer, you can self publish or you can publish. I had to find kind of in between. I didn't want to self publish, but a publisher is not going to be so, uh, giving of the profits. Right. So I went to, um, uh, kind of a hybrid publisher that said, absolutely, man, we'll sell through the regular places and take our cut, but everything that you do on your own and any dollar that goes to you, we could care less about it's more the merrier. So I sell a lot of books on my own because it cuts out them, which they're fine with. And all that money goes to these organizations and the money that comes to me through sales on Amazon and all that other stuff, hundred percent of that gets divided up. So that's awesome. I wish I would have known you because I actually have an amazing guy. We can talk after the show in uh, Florida, Archangel. And then, by the way, his last name is really Archangel. People think that's not real. And I'm like, that's no, amazing. it's actually a Dutch name, but uh, he would have just charged you a flat fee to get it all handled. And then every cent, you know, would have gone yeah. uh, through the, you know, the, the, the folks of your choice, you know, all the various charities and, and places that you want to give it to and stuff like that. But anyway, you know, everything happens for a reason. Um, but I will introduce you to him uh, for the future. Definitely. He's amazing. Definitely. Um, so talk yeah. about some of the uh, participants then, you know, I mean, yeah. just, you know, maybe a little bit of background on a couple select ones. Oh, of course. Um, and, and they're all great. I, I love talking about it. And one of the funnest things for me, Jay, is when I get a, a conversation with somebody who's, who's uh, had time to read the book is I, I'll go, what's your favorite story? And they're all, they all have a different one. They all have a different story. Um, but I'll tell you, there's some that really, really touch me. There's a story of Bobby and Bobby's story is kind of amazing. He uh, was a troubled guy, had self-sabotaging himself, you know, kind of a womanizer, um, you know, successful guy, but just not really in tune with the emotional side of himself. Didn't believe he'd deserve love, that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. He meets just this from the second he sees her, he goes, it was, it was like putting on a new pair of glasses, man. I could see, I could see clearly for the first time in my life. And from date one, uh, they, they were together, right? Wow. Um, they got married a couple of years later. Um, and then um, right before they got married, she got cancer. Right after she got married, right after they married, it relapsed and she died shortly after. Wow. Very heartbreaking, uh, just an unbelievably heartbreaking story. But through that story, he was able to grow enough and learn enough. And Brandy was able to teach him enough that when the opportunity came for him to find love again, he was okay finding love again. And my, uh, and his story is so touching and it's so inspiring because you feel, uh, you feel so bad for him on having lost the love of his life. And, and he says, listen, I, I wish that Brandy didn't die. Right. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I wouldn't want anybody to have gone through that, but I love my life. I'm as happy yeah. as I could be. My wife is the greatest person in the world. If that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here where I am today. Of course, I wouldn't have wanted it to happen, but it did happen. I can't change that. And I'm thinking to myself, how awesome is it that he felt okay 
to fall in love. In fact, when Brandy was dying, um, she said, you got to make me a promise. And he said, what? And she said, you got to go to therapy for three months after I die, because as much as you and I talk, you're still going to need help. And she said, second of all, uh, I'm kind of bummed out and pissed off because I made you a better you and you need to be somebody that's in love. And the next woman is going to be the benefactor of all my hard work. Dude. Let it happen. Let it oh, happen. That is so amazing. That's it. That's, that's my jam right there. That's yeah. soul level stuff. Yeah. That's that soul of that woman. Knowing that the man that she loved, who she built, because that's my wife. Now my wife has built me. She is my spiritual mentor, but knowing that all the work she put in will not go to waste and that, you know, he will now meet somebody worthy of the love that she gave him. And so that it can be, you know, the synergy. Cause I mean, you know, this David, but uh, we are here as souls to give and to receive love. That's it. Yeah. There is nothing. Yeah. It's not about your job or your career or being a good dad, a good husband, you know, donating to charities. It's literally at a soul level, giving and receiving love. And the more that you, you know, make, the more you can take. It's again, quantum physics. It's, if you every day you serve humanity through your acts of you know highest contributional, as I say, the highest and best contributional level of you, you're going to just manifest love into your life from every level of expression. So that is so beautiful. I mean, every time I hear stories like that, I kind of choke up because that's exactly that woman's soul at a soul level knew that yeah. he was going to meet another female, you know, you know another soul being that could then connect that energy that they started together. That's a, it's beautiful, man. It's a beautiful story. I mean, it's very, very tragic, very inspiring, very touching. That's a, that's a, that's a great story. And, and it's actually one of the longer stories in it. Um, I'll tell you another story that I really like, and I don't get to talk about it much. And that's the story of Patricia. Um, and Patricia's story is absolutely amazing. Remember I told you in the beginning, Jay, how point A is when they encounter cancer Yes. Point B today, how do they get there? And then in relation to the trauma they had before. So check this out. Okay. Here's a woman who, when I met her, her story was she had cancer five different times Damn. over a 35 year period, she basically was at her oncologist practice longer than her oncologist, you know, very much into journaling, self-care, taking care of yourself, wow. learning as much as you can, but just, it just came back breast cancer. This thyroid cancer, blah, 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 you name it, right? And basically, she's at the point where whatever whatever happens to her next, she's done because they can't cut anything else out, right? And I'm thinking to myself, how does somebody have that kind of strength, right? Well, guess what, Jay? You know what her story is all about? She was literally kept captive for four years in an unbelievably abusive relationship, like literally captive beat up at every second, just, just oppressed in every way possible, shut off from the world. It was absolutely horrible, right? Now imagine coming out of that situation, finding love. She literally found love the second she encountered cancer. And to come out of a situation where you were so abused and so controlled and were subjected to such, remember that movie with Julia Roberts, you know, where she had to like rechange her identity to get away from the dude. Remember yeah. that whole thing? Yeah. She basically had to do that. And imagine now being able to um, uh, feel proud of who you are and go about living your life. And she's wonderful, she's a super wonderful woman. And then where, so where, where do you get the strength to go through five bouts of cancer with 35 years? Now I can understand how you can get that strength because if you can come out of a four-year abusive relationship, allow yourself to find love and have enough self-worth and enough, enough, enough self-love to live an amazing, productive, vibrant life, you got the strength to go through cancer five, five times, right? Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing story. So that's another one that I really love. Yeah, so I, that, it is beautiful. I, I would say too, and, and just as my awareness is that a, a soul being that powerful mm -hmm. to go through that, you know, that was a choice that she made before, you know, coming into that body that that was like part of her learning uh, and evolving and growing. Even though, again, if you look at it from a perspective of suffering, you know, most of us would say, well, Jesus, but in reality, 
that was her gift. Her gift was dealing with that and overcoming that, you know, again, from a soul level, because she had so much to give, which obviously she proved, you know? Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. And she has a saying that has never left my brain. Sometimes I don't pay attention to it, but I think subconsciously, I'm always thinking about it. She said something to me, and maybe she stole this, the, the, uh, the saying, so you've heard it before, but maybe you haven't. And if you haven't, it's going to stick with you too, that when she's looking in the mirror, right? She's getting ready to go uh, um, water skiing with, with her husband and some friends. And she's in the middle of chemotherapy and wow. she, she, she has to uh, get a hat. She forgot a hat because they're going out on the boat all day. And she, she walks back into the mirror and she looks at herself in the mirror and she sees she has no eyebrows and she has no hair and she puts on her scarf and a hat and she smiles at herself. Because she's, and what she says to herself is she says, everybody has their time in the barrel. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, how powerful is that? That she just says, hey, everybody, everybody's going through something, right? Yeah. So why is she going to be pitiful? Why is she going to be down on herself? Why is she not going to live her life? She's like, everybody has their time in the barrel. And I just think that is something that I could take. That's, yeah. I can, I can deal with that. So I'm not going to have pity for somebody that's going through something hard because maybe they can handle it and they got a view like, uh, I, I got my time in the barrel. It's my time, whatever, big deal. And now instead of having pity for them and being afraid to talk to them about things, maybe I can show them strength and match the strength that they have and interact with them on a different level. Maybe they, pity is the last thing that I should have for them, but naturally I might think that. Wow. Do you know? That's profound, man. Like I really don't have a lot of words for that, but Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell. Quick commercial for the Optimized Tribe with U.S. Navy SEAL Michael Jaco and I every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. There is not a single group online where you will get the highest level intel that Michael and I can provide you from mastering intuition to fully optimizing your hormonal health to improving your fitness, to raising your vibration and increasing your consciousness. There isn't a single group online with two dudes like Michael and myself helping people become the best version of their self. It's literally $99 a month and you get a 90 minute call with me and Michael every single Monday night. Don't wait another second. Sign up now at the link, theoptimizedtribe.com. I appreciate you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. You know, I would say again, she was almost like the way I would look at it. She was an ascended master in physical form. <laughs> Teaching us or teaching all the people that were blessed to be in her energy and to experience her, you know, physical incarnation or body form or whatever, which you obviously were blessed to do. Um, I mean, dude, honestly, I'm so excited listening to you now. I'm definitely going to have to read your book. Oh, it's dude, you're going to love, you're going to love some of the stories, Jay. You're, you're going to love Deborah's story and you're, you're really going to love um, a story about a woman who I'm going to tease you with this one, but a woman who... Her husband comes to her and wakes her up at three in the morning and says, um, they're going to wheel you in now for surgery that will potentially kill you. You've got a grapefruit-sized tumor in your brain, and there's nothing they can do but try to extricate it, and you might die. And you know what her response was? To squeeze his hand and, and smile, and tears of joy came out of her eyes. That's awesome. Yeah. Tears of joy. Could you imagine being told that? and smiling and having tears of joy come out of your eye. So I'll tease you with that one because that's a hard one to wrap your brain around, but you're going to love that story too because it's definitely, um, it follows so, your team. So I will add to that. Um, then again, this is just my awareness and my knowing, uh, and I've done a lot of work, a lot of meditative introspection, contemplation, sitting in stillness and sitting in silence. When you get to a level of awareness, what I call cosmic awareness, you realize that you are so much more than this physical body. You mm -hmm. all you are is a spirit inhabiting a physical vessel. Who again learn and evolve and grow your soul, or your higher self, or your spirit, whatever you want to look at it as. And she was one of those people, and she knew that there's no death. Her physical body might die, but her yeah. energy you know, her soul, her spirit, her chi, whatever you want to call it is going to continue because energy is, you know, ever expanding and infinite. You cannot compress energy. So energy doesn't die. It just continues on. So, so, so she knew that, you know, her energy, her soul would continue. And yeah, so it doesn't matter, but you're right. I mean, when you first hear that, I mean, most people are scared shitless of death. Their whole life is constrained because 
you know, I mean, how many people do you know? You know, we're in that age group right now. It's like, oh man, if I die, you know, who's going to take care of so and so? Who's going to pay for this? And who's going to do that? And it's like, dude, that, none of that shit matters. What matters is you giving and receiving love. I know we're getting woo right now, but it, it, it's you do as a being have to get to a point where you don't fear death, and that's not easy to do. That takes a lot of reflection. And what mm-hmm. I call stillness. And that woman 100% knew and she had zero fear, mm-hmm. which is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Can I, can I t- do we have time for one yeah, more? Absolutely, story? bro. Yeah, of course. So I'll tell you the story of Dominic because that's exactly in response to what you just said. And the story of Dominic is absolutely amazing. And um, uh, he was, he turned into a good, very good friend. Nice. And um, through this process and and it's great great story uh, a tragic story but but a really neat story and i know that our uh, time together had an effect on him and a positive one because here's what happened is young when he was in his teens he got cancer and he was told he was going to die and he told to get his orders in get his life in order and his affairs in order and he was going to die and uh, very very tough for a teenager to take and he didn't die um, but out of that thought that he was going to die, he kind of lost hope and uh, he turned to drugs. He turned to crime. He turned to isolationism. He, he, um, he had never attached himself to the things that were important in life. And sure enough, the cancer came back uh, 10 years later. And um, this time the same oncologist said, yeah, you know how before I told you you're going to die and you didn't, he says this time I'm, there's no way you're going to survive. <laughs> Right. So sorry, but get, get everything in order. And the freaking guy beats the cancer again. Okay. And so um, I'm having a conversation with Dominic one night, Jay. And he says to me, he breaks down a little bit. He, he's not a guy that would break down a lot, but he broke down a little bit. And he said, David, I'm so afraid of dying. He said, my whole life, I've been living with the thought that I'm going to die. And I said to him, I said, Dominic, wouldn't it be, be more honest and truthful if I were to tell you that possibly you're afraid to live because you've been told you're going to die your whole life. Exactly. You're afraid to live. And, and, and he thought about it and he said, oh my God, there's so many things that I want to do in my life, but I never have done them because I always was afraid I was going to die. And, um, and it was such a wonderful revelation for him and, and it, it was brought on by his uh, other, other factors as well. And I just happened to come into his life at the time when he was starting to contemplate this idea of living and doing the things that he always thought he'd never have time for because he ended up having the time. Now, unfortunately, a, a third cancer came along that was terminal and he died recently. But Sorry. he died. Yeah, thank you. He died very happy. Um, obviously, he didn't want to die. No question. Right. Wife and right. kid. And a, and, a, and a good life. He didn't want to die, but he died happy because he, he got to do some of the things that he, he never did. He connected with people in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, he accepted love. He accepted himself. He he's a wonderfully giving man his whole life, but he never allowed himself to be in the movie. He was kind of always watching the movie and, um, um, just a wonderful, wonderful story. And it's, and it's, and it's on that theme of, you know, the same, same kind of things you've been talking about the whole time we've been talking is, beautiful. is just that, 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 that just wanting love and being able to give it and being able to receive it. And really, is there anything more in life? And when yeah. he, when he finally was allowed to love himself and allow the people around him to know that he accepted their love he really transformed himself. It was amazing. amazing, David. I mean, look, man, um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. (laughs) Um, so that, how old was he when he died? Uh, mid forties, early forties. He lived, he lived long enough to, you know, figure out what was happening. But, you know, my first comments, you know, being a guy that, that has, you know, been, you know, lobbying and, you know, how would I say it? Haranguing established allopathic care of medicine for so long. I mean, that's just another example of why you don't listen to them. Mm-hmm. Because imagine what they did to him. They pigeonholed him into, you only have this long or 
Yep. Blah, blah, blah. So like you said, he was afraid of living. You know, it's the, the I think of the movie Shawshank Redemption. Remember when uh, Morgan Freeman says, you can get busy living yeah. or you can get busy dying, right? So yeah. like allopathic medicine just shoehorned him into a corner. Yep. And sadly, he didn't have somebody until he found you, you know, in his life to like say, bro, who cares what they say? You know, yeah. you as a being manifest and control your reality through your words, thoughts, and actions. So don't listen to that shit, you know, and I wouldn't even say get a second opinion because I don't care what allopathic medicine says to me. And again, I don't want to make this a, you know, go somewhere else with this because this is a profound point and I could, um, you know, and I don't want to make it relevant to the current time and age, but like, man, trust in self. Yeah. Literally right. that simple trust. Yeah. in self. I, I totally agree. And to be fair, um, and what's pretty, pretty cool is um, when he had cancer the second time, there was a nurse that took care of him. Oh, nice. And um, he ended up reconnecting with her a few years later. They ended up getting married and she that was, is amazing. Yeah. She, she was, a she was the influence in his life. So there's I just, always I, an angel. There's always, there's always an, an angel. angel. Yeah. yeah. There's always an angel in between the dark side Yep. that rescues the, yeah, the people that's dude. That's the story of planet earth, man. It, it is. And I was just lucky enough to come along at the time when he was in the middle of this transformation <clears throat> and <clears throat> thinking about, excuse me, harder things. And, um, it's a really beautiful, touching story. I mean, tragic for sure, but definitely inspiring and, and hopeful. And it's real life, man. It's real. It's real life. That's real it's life, brother. It's real totally. life. Totally amazing, man. And David, I really appreciate you coming on the Jay Campbell podcast today telling the story. I am going to order the book immediately as soon as I hang up with you from Amazon and read it. It sounds absolutely amazing. Is there anything else that you would like to say before I promote and you know, let people know where they can find you? I mean, how, what about people connecting with you, um, yeah. you know, throughout life right now? You know, the only thing I love to hear as a result of this book is how people, it's helping people communicate. So if any of your you know, any of your community happens to grab a hold of it um, and they want to send me their thoughts, share their thoughts, put a review up or even write a little story and, and post it to the website or whatever. I, I, I love that. I thrive off of that. I think we're all um, connected by, by emotion and what better way to connect through except for by stories. So, um, so yeah, just share, just share your thoughts with me. I love that. Yeah, I'll look at you. Man. Well, see, this is David's website. So you guys, uh, you know, obviously support the amazing people that come on the J Campbell podcast, but you can go to David Richman, R I C H M A N dot com, mm -hmm. pick up a copy of his book. And of course, you can also find it, I'm sure, on Amazon too, correct? Yeah. So the, you can buy it on Amazon. Or you can buy a signed copy with me, uh, ebook, whatever you want. And um, you can rest assured that 100% of the, of, the, of the net proceeds are going to these great organizations. And I list them all on the website. So beautiful. Yeah. That's they're all there. And yep. also you guys can find David on Facebook at facebook.com cycle of lives. And he's also on RG at David, <laughs> David Richmond underscore cycle of lives. Thanks David, to my media funny. expert, my wife. <laughs> Dude, don't even get me going about social media. Yeah. Thankfully I, mean, I have people that monitor all that stuff for me. I do okay. have one, you know, uh, place I go on uh, Twitter. I post the most profound you know, uh, outrageous woo woo stuff as much as I can. And, you know, I talk about aliens and demons and all that stuff, but nice. that's it, man. what, what an amazing, uh, human being you are. Uh, thank you for doing the work that you did. I will order the book and I know for sure that a lot of people in my audience will absolutely uh, purchase it too. Um, thanks for coming on brother. I truly appreciate it. You're very welcome, Jay. And let's definitely stay connected. Cause I, uh, I think, I think I could learn a lot from you. I would love to. Absolutely, man. And I have your cell phone number, so I will text you after this podcast. So again, for all of you amazing people, please support the amazing folks that come on the Jay Campbell podcast, go to David's site. You can also find him. It's the cycle of lives.org. And you can also find him on Facebook at facebook.com cycle of lives and IG at David Rickman underscore. Yep. cycle of lives and remember raise your vibration to optimize your love creation we will see all of you guys very soon